Hello and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at St. Paul's Church of the Nazarene. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be unto you. Over the last week, three weeks, we discussed uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we noted Paul's emphasis on the resurrection of Jesus as the guarantee and the means of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, his emphasis on resurrection as the defeat of death, and his emphasis on the resurrection as central to the Christian way of life. Tonight we will be continuing our series on resurrection in the New Testament, turning our attention to John's account of the Easter story and his post and Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. Now, in order to understand what John is doing in the resurrection narrative itself, we have to take a step back and look especially at the crucifixion narrative. And as we discuss the resurrection narrative, I'll point out a couple of other places in the gospel according to John where, John, uh, where that, that are significant for what John is saying in the resurrection account. So there are several key points from the story of Jesus' crucifixion and burial that will shape our approach to the resurrection narrative. The first is that Jesus is crucified specifically as king of the Jews, and John emphasizes this a lot. Pilate writes it on the sign above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and then the chief priests argue about it, um, claim that, uh, saying it should instead say that he claimed that to be king of the Jews, um, but Pilate refuses to change it. Um, and then just before that in the trial scene, the last, one of the last things John, uh, Pilate asks the crowd is, shall I crucify your king? Um, and they respond, we have no king but Caesar. So we have this emphasis throughout Jesus' trial and crucifixion that Jesus is indeed king and king of the Jews. And this is exactly what the disciples were hoping for, what the people of Israel had been longing for, the return of the king of the Jews who would restore the people of Israel to their rightful place. And Jesus is indeed king of the Jews. But his crucifixion meant that he was king of the Jews in a way that was nothing like what they expected the king of the Jews to be. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is there's a particular phrasing in most English translations. Uh, in John 19.30, at Jesus' death, it says he gave up his spirit. Um, the word his is not actually in the Greek. and, and the more accurate represent, uh, translation would be he gave up the Spirit, um, which is very probably a reference to the Holy Spirit. So that what we have in John's Gospel is that Jesus, in Jesus' death, the Holy Spirit that has been on him since his baptism is unleashed back out into the world. Um, and this will become especially important when we discuss his encounter with his disciples in the upper room in something we'll discuss that we we'll talk about next week. The third important point is that Jesus is crucified in John's Gospel, um, in the Gospel according to John, around the same time that the Passover lambs are slaughtered. Um, and so we have this connection between what is happening in Jesus' death and the salvation that it brings and the exodus from Egypt. Um, fourth, we have this note that Jesus receives a proper Jewish burial, um, including all of the necessary spices and uh, ointments, um, which actually raises the question of why Mary Magdalene was going to Jesus' tomb. But the last and probably the most important, especially for considering the beginning of John 20 and the resurrection narrative, is how John describes where the tomb is, where the tomb is located, the tomb in which Jesus' body is laid. 
John writes that the that or John writes that in the place where Jesus was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby they laid Jesus there. In other words, Jesus is buried in a tomb in a garden in a place of death, in the place of the skull it is called earlier, um, in the place where he is crucified. And when we think about gardens in the Bible, we should remember the Garden of Eden, the first garden. The garden from which humanity was barred after its sin. And the Garden of Eden was the place where life flourishes but becomes the place of where death takes hold. And here in Jesus' death and burial, there is a, place, a garden that is a place of death. But the resurrection is coming and all of that is about to change. So with all of that in mind, we turn now to our text tonight, which comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. God's word reads, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came on behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Then he, he, is the, he was the gardener. She said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I have been ascending to my God and your, uh, your God, to my Father and your Father. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. So John's account of, the, of Easter, of the resurrection narrative, begins with his description of when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. It is early on the first day of the week while it is still dark. This might not seem very important at first glance, but if we remember that this story has been connected with the Garden of Eden by the story of the crucifixion and thus with the creation story. And also with the creation story by the very beginning of John's Gospel. So remember with me, although we did not read it, I mentioned it before I read our text for today, that the story of Jesus' crucifixion ends in a garden, when he is buried in a tomb in a garden in the place where he was crucified. And that go back as we remember the Garden of Eden, and here we have two gardens where death has taken root. And John has also called our attention back to creation from the very start of his gospel. The very first words that he wrote were in the beginning, echoing Genesis 1-1.
So from the very start of the Gospel according to John, we've been invited to consider the story of creation in Genesis and how what God is doing now in the person of Jesus is related to that story. So, when we hear that it is the first day of the week, we should remember that creation begins on the first day. And so we have this hint, this reminder, this indication that new creation begins on the first day of the week with the resurrection of Jesus. Then our story continues with Mary Magdalene leaving the tomb and going off to tell Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved that the tomb is empty. So those disciples run and check it out and there's this subtle emphasis on the strips of linen that had been wrapped around Jesus' body. Twice they are mentioned in the story. And then the cloth that had been around his head is also mentioned. It's such an odd thing to note, and especially to mention twice. Until we remember, there's another account of somebody being raised from the dead in John's Gospel. John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and he comes out and this is how the scene is described. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. In other words, we are reminded that the burial clothes was still on Lazarus when he came out of the grave. But those same burial clothes are lying in the grave, in the tomb that is empty when it comes to Jesus. And so there's this indication here that there is something very different going on from, the, uh, from Lazarus being raised to the dead to Jesus being raised from the dead. See, Lazarus is ra was raised as one who is still caught in the wrappings of death, who is still bound and subject to death. Jesus, however, was raised to new resurrection life. He is no longer bound by death. In God's resurrection act of new creation, Jesus is raised to life eternal and cannot die again. And then there's this puzzling thing. When the disciple goes into the tomb, and when the disciple whom Jesus loved goes into the tomb and sees the strips lying there, he believes. Except it doesn't say what he believes. And, it, and I don't think that he believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. After all, the very next verses, they still didn't understand from the scripture that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. I mean, probably he just believed that Mary Magdalene was right, that the tomb was empty, that Jesus' body had been taken somewhere else, and the strips of linen lying there were really weird to him as well. But, but we continue, as we continue in the story of Jesus, we will have more and more people encounter the risen Jesus and believe that he has indeed been raised from the dead, and it will culminate in Thomas's ultimate confession of my Lord and my God. But our stories continue with the disciples leaving, going back to where they were staying, and Mary Magdalene standing outside the tomb weeping and bending over and looking into the tomb and seeing two angels in the tomb seated where Jesus' body had been. Strangely, One's at the head and the other's at the foot, is mentioned. John seems to make this completely random comment about where the two angels are. But maybe there's another image that John is trying to bring to our minds here. In Jewish thought, God was thought to reside 
to be most present in the Holy of Holies, and especially to be seated on top of the altar of the Altar of Covenant before they lost it. Indeed, this has even been referred to this, this place at the top of the Ark of the Covenant, God's seat, is referred to as the Mercy Seat. But the image of the Ark of the Covenant and of its covering is that of two angels at either end, one at each end. So we have here this imagery that echoes the description of the Ark of the Covenant where one angel is on one side and the other angel is on the other, and the space in between is where God is to be found. The implication that God is to be found between these two angels in the tomb, in the very space where Jesus' body had been laid, that this person, Jesus of Nazareth, was indeed God. In other words, that God was to be found in the person of Jesus, something John emphasized in, verses, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And then the angels asked Mary why she is crying. She explained she cannot find the body of her Lord. And then the angels vanish. And instead, Jesus is there and asks her the same question. Why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? But she doesn't recognize him. There is something different about this Jesus. Or she is kept from recognizing him by God for now. Instead, she thinks he's a gardener. And we're back to the garden theme again. We are still in the story of new creation. And indeed, the gardener was the role of Adam. And we are remembering the story of creation where a garden of life became a garden of death. And here we have a garden of death becoming a garden of life. Adam's role in the garden in creation was to care for it, to be its gardener. And now we have Jesus, the gardener. Because although he is not just any gardener and he is, does not recognize him as Jesus, Jesus is still a gardener. He is the one who tends to the new creation that has begun with his resurrection. And so he fulfills the role that Adam failed to do in the garden. The role of gardener. So that life, new life, resurrection life might flourish. Then Mary asked where she might find the body. Assuming that this gardener might have carried him away someplace. And he responds by calling her name. She is shot, turning toward him, grasping him and crying out, Rabboni, teach her. And so he tells her, let go of me. Go, tell my brothers that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. We have this implication in this verse where Jesus uses the verb for ascending twice. Is that when Mary lets go of him and goes back to tell, Jesus will ascend. In John's Gospel, there's not this long period between his resurrection and his ascension. His ascension seems to return later that same day. And it is for the same purpose that the ascension happens in Acts, so that he might pour out the Spirit on his disciples. As will be clear from the stories that we will talk about next week. 
of Jesus in the upper room on the night of that first day of the week. And Mary goes and tells the disciples that she has seen the Lord and that he has said to her these things. So then, what does this story teach us? What does it mean for us? First, we have this emphasis on new creation and the resurrection of Jesus. And this idea that it has cosmic implications that Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of new creation and that will mean a new creation for the whole world. And then the emphasis on the garden reminds us that this act of new creation is largely about undoing what has happened because of humanity's sin in the Garden of Eden. And the crucifixion narrative reminds us, the fact that it happens at Passover reminds us that this is an accomplished by an act, by means of an act that frees God's people. It is the act of Passover and Exodus that frees God's people from slavery to Egypt. And now in the crucifixion and the resurrection, God frees us from slavery to sin and death. And it is a call for us, having been freed from slavery to sin and death, to join in to this new creation to join into this resurrection life and to be a witness to God's work to redeem and to restore and to make all things new and to do so as we are empowered by the Spirit of God that Jesus pours out after he goes after he ascends to the Father so then let us pray Lord, we are so grateful for your act of new creation and resurrection. We thank you for setting us free from sin and death by the crucifixion and resurrection of your Son. Help us to live into your new creation, into your transforming and your resurrection grace. In the name of Jesus, our crucified and resurrected Lord, we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and the peace of God as members of God's new creation.